Hello, today we're going to be doing our first set of notes here in marine biology. And this set of notes is going to be on the latitude and longitude system. Now what we've done so far in the two geo stories that you've looked at is getting to the point of understanding the first interactions that humans had with the oceans. What did we use them for? Mostly it was to get from place to place, see what else was out there. So we decided over time that we wanted to know more about the oceans. It's kind of a collective knowledge. And as you can see with the second geo story that we did, going from about 200 years ago to now, it was really focused not on going from place to place, seeing the people that are there and what, what riches we could find there, but now it's more about let's see what's underneath this surface. Let's go down as far as we can and let's see what organisms are down there. And the development of those particular tools, whether it's scuba gear that we can go from place to place underwater personally and see, or whether it's submersibles that we can take, uh, whether it's remote or whether there are manned submersibles that we can go around under the water and see what's happening in places that we normally uh, haven't been able to get to. That's been the last couple hundred years. Part of that process is figuring out how can we reliably get from place to place. It's the navigation part. And that's this latitude and longitude system. So in your notebooks, I can open up to the next available right page. On the top of that right page, here's our title. It's the latitude and longitude system. Go ahead and write that down now. Once you have that written down, I'd like you to take your writing utensil indent about a third of the page, not quite half, about a third. I want you to draw a line separating your paper all the way down to the bottom into a left and right column. These are going to be modified cat notes. This is how I want you to be taking the notes for this class. So a line right down the, uh, the page, uh, and we have this latitude and longitude system for a title. Titles are extremely important. It allows us to find that information later on. Now the first part of what we're going to do here is going to go on the left hand side, and that's this information right here, it's the basic layout of the oceans. Write that down on the left side of that line. And then on the right hand side, that's where information is going to go. So we'll talk a little bit about the basic layout of the oceans here. This is what goes on the right. Now you don't need every single word written down. Otherwise I just photocopy this and give it to you and that's not what we're doing. We're learning to take these notes write down the important pieces of information. So on the right, the land masses here are dividing the ocean. Land masses divide the oceans. Now, I wouldn't write this part here down in parentheses. I wouldn't write that. But you could write something along those lines. Just understand that my expectations are that you understand the oceans and the land masses that are dividing them up. And here's our oceans. I'd write this down also on the right-hand side. Our North Pacific, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. Make sure you spell Arctic correctly. There are two C's. It's not Arctic. That's incorrect. Not a word. You'll be marked off wrong for that one. But you better make sure that you know where these particular ocean basins are. You know, we have this North Pacific over here. Know the landmass that is separating the Pacific and the Atlantic. Geography, for a lot of you, was a long time ago, so refresh your memory about what a map looks like and the information that this map will have on there. Now, we talked about this next part already a little bit. Want to make sure we get that down. It also goes on the right-hand side. 72% of the Earth's ocean. And what you'll notice here is that 80% of the southern hemisphere, that's this southern portion right down here, 80% is ocean. That's a huge amount of area that's ocean down there. Not a lot of people living in the Southern Hemisphere because only 20% of the space is land. Very different up in the Northern Hemisphere. Only 61%, I say only, comparing to that Southern Hemisphere. Still more than half is ocean up here. Got that Arctic at the top, remember. But there's a lot more land available. That's where more of the people are. So a lot of the stuff that we'll be talking about let me kind of focus on this northern hemisphere because there's more people there and, of course, that's where we live. Okay, so, should have uh, these three points down on that right-hand side. We're going to move on to the next 
section here, which is our purpose of this navigation system. So go ahead and get that on the left side of your paper, purpose of the system. And then on the right side, we're explaining what is on the left. It's our detailed information. The purpose of the system is because when we're in the middle of the ocean, there's no landmarks. You look around and you see water, water everywhere. So how do you know where you are? How can you figure out where you're going? That's the purpose of this particular system. It's to identify specific locations on the surface of the earth when we don't have anything to compare it to. Once we can find where certain locations are, we can then share this information. So we can go over here to uh, this sketch of the Earth, and we can say, look, we can find this point right here. And we can share whatever is at that particular point with other people, and they can go to that same place as well. Captain Cook, European that discovered Hawaii. Nice of him to tell everyone else where Hawaii is because lots of people go there now. We're able to share that information because of this particular system on the left-hand side. What is this system? What's actually happening with this latitude and longitude system? So that goes on the left-hand side. On the right, description of what the system is. It's an imaginary grid. And this imaginary grid runs over the surface of the Earth. No, we can't see it, of course, imaginary. But think of all these boxes and squares and points over the entire surface. Now, on the map here, you can see the dark ones pretty easily. It could be a little bit difficult for you to see, but there are some smaller ones. And it'll get smaller and smaller and smaller until we can get to these very pinpoint locations within this particular grid. Just like with grids and math, we have these lines running particular area, and where the lines running uh, in this horizontal, where they cross, we can find that particular point very easy. The lines that are running east to west, these are the horizontal lines, are called the latitude lines. On the left, right, latitude lines on the right run east-west. It's very important, these latitude lines. Longitude lines... These are, the way I remember it, they're really long lines. So on the left, write down longitude lines. And these particular lines run north to south. So we have latitude lines on the left, on the right, run east-west. Longitude lines on the left, and on the right, run north-south. Now, the labeling that we use for these particular lines, it's labeled in degrees. Kind of like temperature. The main latitude and longitude lines, like I mentioned before, can be subdivided into smaller and smaller and smaller grids. And as we get smaller, we start off with these degrees, and then we can take each degree and divide it into what we call a minute. And I'll talk about why it's a minute in a little bit. And each one of those minutes can be divided even further into seconds. So we have these degrees, we have these minutes, and we have these seconds. And it gives us a very, very pinpoint location uh, on the surface of the Earth. So let's talk first here a little bit about the latitude lines. Here's a picture showing the just latitude lines in the northern hemisphere. You can see these white lines kind of moving around here. So on the left, right latitude. On the right-hand side, key thing to remember about the latitude lines. They never intersect. They're also what we call the parallels. So these particular lines never cross each other. The zero degree line, that's this one down here, is one you're familiar with. So on the right hand side, zero degree, and I just put an equal sign, the equator. This is the widest point on the Earth. That's where the equator is. People say, oh, it's in the middle. Well, no. It's at the widest circumference of the Earth. That's the Zero degree latitude. Now, if we're just looking at this northern hemisphere. Each of the lines above the equator to the north increase in number until it reaches the North Pole. Same thing for the ones going south. 
So above and below, they'll increase in number. So here's our 0, 15, 30, 45, 60, and then we'll get up to at the very top, the maximum number is 90. So the same thing down here. This is 0, and then we go 15, and then we can keep going to 30, and then 45, etc. For our maximum number at the pole to be 90 degrees. The way that we differentiate between whether we're going to the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere is by adding north or south. So if it's above the equator, we call those the north parallels. And if it's below the equator, we call those the south parallels. And that's designated by an N or an S next to the degree number. One unique thing about these particular lines, and you can see it on the map here, these lines here are pretty big. But as we get up here closer and closer to this pole, the line actually becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. They become shorter because the circumference is being reduced. So again, on the right-hand side, each parallel is shorter as you near those poles. We're reducing that circumference as we get closer to those poles. On the left-hand side, write down the longitude. And then on the right, Longitude lines, a little bit different. You can see them here uh, in both of these maps. These start at one pole and go all the way down to another. They start at one pole. This is the same picture here, but opened up. Starting here, go all the way down to uh, the other pole. These lines are not the parallels. Because if we're starting at one pole, we're going all the way down to another, where we're going to intersect with another. So these, we call these the meridian lines. So meridians, that's on the right-hand side also. Now the zero-degree meridian is called the prime meridian. And this prime meridian runs through the royal, I'll move over here, you can see this a little bit better, Royal Naval Observatory in Greenwich, England. The Royal Naval Observatory is the point at which the English explorers would leave from. It's a shipyard just outside of London, it's a suburb of London. And so they decided to make this particular point as they developed this meridian system, this longitudinal and latitudinal system. This is the point that they said, okay, we're gonna make this our starting point. There is no widest point of the earth when we're going from the north to the south. So we had that zero degree going through England on the other side, it's 180 degrees. Now, if we look northward from the equator, don't write all of this yet. Hold on just a second. Looking northward from the equator, the meridians on the right are called the east longitude, all the way until you get to 180. The meridians here on the left are called west longitude all the way until we get to 180 degrees. So write this down on the right-hand side. Here's what you want to write. Looking northward from equator. Those four words on the right. Indent a little bit. Meridians on right equal east longitude. And then meridians on left equals west longitude. We'll take a look at this video in a few minutes, so we'll come back to that one. Quick example of how we use these particular meridians and how it's been used. Here uh, is the longitude and the latitude. You'll notice that the latitude here has that N for north, so we know we're in the northern hemisphere. The longitude has this W for west. So we know that we're from Prime Meridian, which is right here in England, we're to the left. So we take a look at these numbers, they're telling us something. This is 41 degrees, this little zero up here. 43 minutes, it's got a little apostrophe. 57 seconds, it's got two, north. So 41 degrees, 43 minutes, 57 seconds north. We got 49 degrees, 56 minutes, and 49 seconds west. This brings us to a particular point and this particular point that it's bringing us to is right here. When you move to that point on the ocean surface, you'll find that you are directly above the Titanic. 
uh, about two miles above the Titanic. But that'll bring us to that point every single time, going to these particular coordinates. You don't need to write any of this down. You can say to write any of it down. You don't need to. This is just an example of what it looks like. Now, how do we get all of those numbers? That's this next part uh, right here. So on the left, write how to measure. Well, we measure this using a tool called a chronometer. This is one of the first ones right here. Kind of looks like a clock, and it is. That's why we use those minutes and seconds. Now, in order for us as humans to figure out our distance being traveled east and west, we needed to come up with a slightly different way of doing that. The latitude lines are easy because it's set from that widest point moving to the north or to moving to the south. It's not going to be changing. But how do you know if you're moving to the east or to the west? Where are these different numbers coming from? So we had to make some decisions. We as in humans. And everybody decided, okay, this is working, so this is going to be how our decision uh, is finalized. The English started off with this particular process. It worked really well. Captain Cook, fantastic example of how well it worked. He had three different voyages, and he was going to the same places because he knew he could get food and supplies in those particular places, and he could find them every time because of this chronometer and this latitude-longitude system. So on the right, the way this works is they would have a clock, and it would be set to the time in London, called Greenwich Mean Time, so the average time in Greenwich, England. Then they would have another clock that they would compare, sorry, they would have another clock that they would take with them and set it for the local time. And they knew what the local time was based on where the sun was. So they knew the sun is rising at 6 o'clock in the morning, so they would set that local clock at 6 o'clock in the morning. Compare the two clocks together. So on the right hand side, they compared the Greenwich Mean Time to the local time, which was based on the sun's position. What we knew from land and travel on land was that the local time changes one hour for every set distance that you travel on the surface of the earth from east to west or west to east. And that set distance corresponds to every 15 degrees of longitude that you travel. It moves one hour, either forward or backward, depending on which way that you're going, of course. So on the right, local time changes one hour for every 15 degrees longitude to travel. The problem was, with this system, that clocks don't work moving up and down on the ships. The gears get all messed up, so they don't tell time correctly. So this chronometer is a special clock that actually has gears that kind of float and allows those gears to work correctly. And it was invented in 1735 by a gentleman by the name of John Harrison. And he invented this clock that works despite any movement. Even some watches now say that they're chronometers. That is, they can be moving around and still keep accurate time because you're moving around. So his chronometer that they use on these ships lead to eventually the development of a pocket watch that they can put in their pocket. They didn't have that before now. And wristwatch, because pocket watches, wristwatches move up and down. So this development allowed them to create those particular ways of keeping track of the time. So as the sailors would move forward uh, to the east or move forward to the west, depending on where they were, of course, they would use these particular clocks to figure out exactly where they were, how far they were east to west. They'd check the time, they would know how many degrees longitude they had traveled based on that Greenwich Mean Time. This particular system, and I jot this down as well, this particular system led to us creating time zones. And those time zones are based on that 15 degree longitude travel. Approximate. We kind of fudge things a little bit depending on states and politics, etc. But it's about every 15 degrees moving east to west, one hour for every 15 degrees. That's the end of the notes. This is